Hello to everybody. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be uh, part of this lecture. So uh, the idea that uh, we will present some research related to uh, value information for spatially distributed systems. And uh, I will give essentially the first half an hour of this lecture that is basically a recap of some general background on spatially distributed systems and a bit on value information, but Carl will go on on some kind of more kind of deeper topics related to research that, that we have done. So uh, I will start with a general introduction on uh, uh, Bayesian inference, so probabilistic, uh, probabilistic way of processing uh, data. And then I will introduce this uh, idea of um, Gaussian processes, Gaussian random fields for modeling uh, um, distributed systems. And then Carl will go on talking about um, specifically uh, value information in these fields, how to compute it in a, an effective way for the purpose, for example, of sensor placement. And then we'll end up uh, talking about um, how to extend this formulation of special temporal processes, which not just uh, time is uh, is a very is. A, not just to um, temporal domain, but including also time. Do you hear me well? Yes. 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 Great. So, but boy, if there's any question, feel free to interrupt me because you know we can in, can interact also during this half uh, this half an hour or after that. So, I think uh, I see you. So, just raise your hand, and I, you know, if there's any question about what I'm, what I'm talking. <laughs> so, um, uh, by Spatially distributed uh, system, uh, uh, we mean any kind of uh, uh, physical quantity that changes in, in space. Think that you have a special domain, maybe a region, and then you have um, a special quantity that varies in different points on this region. So one application that we have, we have studied is a seismic demand. You know, think some parameter like the, the, the PGA or parameters defining the seismic intensity that are different in different places, even during the same earthquake. So you can model that using these approaches, but also temperature. Now, Carl is also working on that. Um, and uh, for example, corrosion, if you think that the damages of corrosion is something that involves a large system, again, you can model that using uh, these approaches. Or permeability of soil is, is another kind of classical topic in which uh, you can think that this specific parameters is uncertain, and you can model its value in different places using uh, these approaches. Um, and then, uh, uh, quite recently, there's been a, a lot of, of, of uh, general work on, uh, in, in, for example, in the community of machine learning and computer science about developing this model for the general purpose of making uh, inference, kind of nonlinear, non parametric inference of, uh, of, uh, of functions. Um, so, uh, by the way, you, you can relate uh, much of what, what I'm saying, that modeling that I'm describing, this Gaussian process of modeling, for example, to literature in uh, structural dynamics, in which uh, for modeling processes that are changing in time, you use the same idea of Gaussian process for, for accounting for uncertainty and variability in time. I'll start with, uh, uh, sorry, with the basic um, with a basic framework for probabilistic inference, the idea is that you have at least a couple of random variables, let's call it F1 and F2, and suppose, for example, that they model uh, temperature in two different locations, okay? Um, suppose that you have a joint model for these two random variables. That means that you have a function that's called the joint distribution that is always non-negative. So define it on the joint domain of these two random variables that's always non-negative and is normalized to one. And it defines essentially what is the probability in terms of density that the temperature in the two rooms is a, is a, a specific value at one F2. And then you can compute uh, mathematically by marginalization. You can compute what are called the marginal distribution. And they define essentially what is your marginal belief, what is your belief of any of this random variable. For example, P of F1, define your marginal belief of uh, on uh, this variable F1, maybe the temperature in the first room. And that is related to this joint model just by integration. 
And then uh, you have this, uh, uh, this conditional probability that works in the following way. Suppose that you observe a specific value of R2. Maybe you observe a temperature in room 2. The question is, what is your updated belief on the temperature in room 1? And to do that, essentially, you take a section of this joint distribution, and this is what this blue curve does. Then you renormalize it. This is just the formula of a conditional distribution. And that gives you your updated belief. And then if you want, you can do the same. You know, if you observe F1, you, know, you will have an updated belief on F2. Uh, so this move is, is just to show you, essentially, what happened uh, when you observe different value of F1 you will see you have uh, always different uh, updated belief on F2. That means that the two random variables are independent, that there is something to learn from one random variable to the other. Um, so the general framework for inference is pretty simple. You start with a joint model. Then suppose you observe that F2 as a specific value. And now F2, like the temperature in the second room, is not a random variable anymore. Maybe you observe that its value is 0.4 as in the picture reported here. <coughs> now the other question is, what is the correspondent probability on F1? And you have a formula for doing that. You take a section, you renormalize it, and you have this, uh, uh, this updated belief. This is by using an inference in a nutshell. Um, specifically, for example, you can have this very special case in which the two random variables are independent. In this case, essentially, the joint distribution is just given by the product of the two random variables. And if you try to make perform inference in this case, well, essentially nothing happens. You have your prior belief, suppose on, on, uh, uh, on F1, that is the marginal belief. And when you observe a specific value of F2, for example, F2 equal 0.2 is in this. Right, can I go on from, from, from this point? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. 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 OK, great, great. So I was telling you, when the two random variables are independent, there's nothing to learn from, from one variable to the other. So as you can see from this movie, no matter what is the value of x1 that you observe, your posterior belief on f2 will be always the same. Because no matter when you, where you cut this joint distribution, you know, the, uh, the, um, the shape of the, of the conditional distribution will be always the same. So after normalization, you got, you got always the same result. So you have learned nothing. This is just a special thing. <coughs> but more generally, when the random variables are dependent, you learn something from, from one observing the other. So the multivariate normal distribution is just one specific case of a joint model. It's probably the most famous model, the nicer, kind of um, simpler somehow model that you can propose for defining uh, the joint distribution of some random variables. It's given by this formula on the top of the slide that looks maybe kind of complicated at the beginning, but after a while, you know, it's not really so complicated. For example, if you take the log of this density, that just is essentially just a quadratic form. This is essentially the extension to dimension more than one of the classical univariate normal distribution. So while the univariate normal distribution is defined just by a mean parameter and a standard deviation parameter, mu and sigma, uh, the multivariate normal distribution is defined by a mean vector that is a vector of, uh, uh, with the size of a number of random variables that you're modeling, and a covariance matrix that is just a square matrix that defines n by n if you have n random variables. And it defines really the covariance between uh, all the pairs of random variables. <laughs> For example, this is a plot of this joint density in the bivariate case, F1, F2, or solve for a specific choice of parameters. This is how it looks like. So the joint distribution is completely defined by these two parameters, mean vector and covariance matrix, and has a, a set of very nice properties. For example, the conditional distribution, no matter where you cut this joint distribution, is always normal. And then, for example, when you have to marginalize this uh, joint density, focus on just uh, one random variables, that corresponding marginal distribution is always normal, is also normal. And then, moreover, even uh, any linear combination of your random variables are, is also normal. So you have this very nice property that makes everything, uh, you know, the inference process very simple. 
So this is just an example again of the variant distribution. And as you see, uh, this joint distribution like POF1 is normal, okay? And it's given, you know, is generally, uh, so is, uh, it is a result of a marginalization process that generally is very complicated, but it's very easy in the normal model. And the result is a normal distribution. Also, if you cut, for example, suppose that you observe that uh, F2 is equal to 0.4. The posterior uh, distribution of F1 stays normal. So it's just a matter of figuring out what are the parameters of this updating distribution. So I can maybe show you this movie that show you, you know, if you suppose that you observe different value of F2, of Y in this case, this notation, you will see that uh, uh, the correspondent uh, posterior distribution of, of F1 stays normal. Moreover, you see that even the, the the variance of the distribution, of this dashed distribution, is always the same. Just the mean changes depending on the specific observation, the specific observation that you get. But this is very nice because it allows you to perform this, uh, uh, this uh, marginalization and uh, um, um, conditional and find out the conditional distribution in a very simple way. I wish also just to show you what happened. When the two distributions are uncorrelated, in this case, they are independent, and see what happens. No matter what is the value of y that you observe, your posterior distribution of x stay always the same. It is equal to the prior one. So essentially, you have learned nothing. If the two random variables are independent, you know, again, you have nothing to learn from observing one random variable to the other. But in the general case, the random variables maybe are not independent, and so you're learning something. From one random variable to Okay, so how can you find out what are the parameters of this uh, conditional distribution? Okay, so the formulas are a kind of simple formula of linear algebra, and it works like this. So suppose you have this joint model for f1 and f2, that they not needs to be just a scalar that can be uh, any vector. You have a joint model for them, given by these kind of vectors and uh, part of a covariance matrix. Then there is a formula, just a linear algebra, that allows you to find out uh, the conditional distribution. So if you observe F2, you know that the posterior distribution of F1 will be still normal, and you can find out what are the corresponding mean vector and covariance matrix. And you can, you know, by the way, it turns out that also you see that covariance matrix is not a function of a specific value of F2 that you observe. And more generally, suppose that you know you have some random variables, and you have a noisy measure of these random variables. Maybe a linear observation. You see why the measure that you have, maybe the measure that the sensor provides you, are given by just a linear combination of your original random variables plus a noise that is normal. If that is the case, for example, you know you can think that uh, uh, maybe one measure is just uh, this kind of linear combination. Suppose you have three random variables of your interest, F1, F2, and F3, and you have a joint model of them. And your first measure is just the sum of F1 and F3 plus some Gaussian noise. And the second measure is given just by one third of F2 plus an offset plus some <coughs> random noise. Then, you know, you can uh, uh, exactly uh, find out what is the posterior distribution of F given any specific reading of your sensor uh, y1 and y2. Sufficient is to uh, define what is the joint distribution of f and y, that is, of your random variable of interest and the sensor reading, and you can do this pretty easily by using some linear combination. And then, for example, you can also know, uh, you can also get pretty easily what is the marginal distribution of your uh, reading of your sensor, so what is the marginal distribution of y, and also, again, what the, the, the real, uh, you know, thing of your of our interest is what is the posterior distribution of F in a Y, okay? And now given, again, by this formula, we're just derived from what I showed you before, and it's just formula from linear algebra, that, you know, in which you combine this matrix and the specific reading that you have, that is described by this, uh, uh, this vector of Y, and you get the mean and covariance matrix of the posterior that is normal. So let me give you some, you know, some, like, so in a nutshell, the idea that when you're dealing with these normal models, the inference process is very uh, simple computation. 
It's just related by linear algebra. So let me show you uh, some basic uh, uh, example of that to define this, uh, this idea of a Gaussian process. Suppose that you have two rooms, like the room in which you are and the room next to that, and there is a temperature, F1 is the temperature in your room, F2 in the temperature in the room next to that. And you define a joint model for these, uh, uh, for these, two, for these two temperatures. This joint model is jointly normal, so this graph on the right reports uh, this counter line of this joint distribution. You see that um, uh, the two random variables are positive correlated, meaning that you tend to think that the two temperatures are pretty similar. If it's hot in your room, you tend to think that also the temperature in the other room is pretty high. And this graph on the, on the left reports samples of that. You, know, you see these samples, these, uh, there are just points in the F1, F2 domain, here on the, on, the, on the left, they are reported at lines that define essentially they start from a temperature in your room and F1 and end up in, uh, with a temperature in the other room, F2. So for example, in this movie shows you what happens if the two random variables are independent. You see that in this case, uh, sorry, sorry, you, that. you see that in this case, uh, the two temperatures are really independent, so you know, you, you, can be cool in one room and hot in the other. And so the slope, for example, of this dashed line connected with two samples, sometimes it's flat, that means that the temperature are the same, sometimes going up, sometimes going down. Because you know you can have a cooler, hotter room. You know, the second one, the second room can be cooler or hotter than the, than the first one. And then you can have an, another model in which you assume the temperature are more similar, and you see that basically in this case the samples are more flat up to the case in which the temperature are kind of almost identical. And in this case, you have uh, almost um, uh, flat lines. So the point is that when you see the temperature in one room, depending on your model, you can update what is the temperature in the other one. You can extend the model for having three rooms. If you have three rooms, you have three random variables. So now I cannot show you the joint distribution with contour lines anymore because we are in a space of three dimensions, but I can still show you samples, right? So again, a reasonable model is that one that says that the temperature in two rooms that are one uh, close to one to the other, they are pretty correlated. So row one, two is close to one, and so row so is row three, two. But maybe room one and room three that are pretty far apart, they are less correlated. So again, these are examples of samples. Again, I can show you uh, some movies, so these are again kind of kind of independent uh, independent samples. Essentially, you can go up to the case of a, a stronger correlation. When you have a stronger correlation, again the idea that the temperature in the free room is more and more similar, and that is uh, when you have this kind of samples. And you can easily also extend the case of this to a model in which maybe you have. 10 rooms. Suppose you have 10 rooms in a row, and again, you have a model that say the temperature in rooms that are close one to the other are kind of similar. Temperature in rooms that are far apart are less correlated. So you can have something like this, you see. Uh, these are the cases in which the correlation decayed pretty fast. And you can have another example like this, in which, as you see, uh, the temperature changed pretty smoothly. So, you know, Maybe when you, when you see what happened in the end, and uh, the beginning and the end of the 10 rooms, then the temperature is kind of different. But if you look again, two rooms are very close one to the other, then the temperature is pretty similar. Okay. This is you know, how you can define a general, you know, the general variation of something as temperature in a spatially distributed field. You can go up to a continuous domain in which maybe you think that you have really hundreds of thousands of billions of, in, of rooms in, uh, along one line, okay? So that in the end, uh, you have a kind of a continuous domain in which you can uh, point out any specific location in this continuous domain, and you have a specific temperature in, uh, in that specific location. And you can model how all these different temperatures are correlated one to the other. That is when you have really a Gaussian process. So in a Gaussian process, you know, the marginal distribution of a temperature in any point is Gaussian. And also, if you pick up any, any set of temperature, any set of location, like two location, three location, and so on, 
the model described, the joint model describing the temperature in all those locations is also jointly captured. So this is just a, you know, a set of samples that you can have when you define a specific structure. So specifically, the structure that we define uh, uh, can follow uh, this, this model. The square exponential covariance function is a specific way of defining how correlated uh, is the temperature, in this case, uh, between two different locations. And the model is pretty simple and tells you that if you pick up two locations that are very, very close one to the other, then because the temperature is continuous, it's a smooth field, the correlation is one, suppose, almost one. Means that, you know, uh, by measuring what is the temperature here, I know essentially what is the temperature also, like one millimeter far away from that, okay? Uh, but if I consider two locations that are pretty far one from the other, then the correlation decays. Mean that these two quantities, temperature here and temperature there, is, are less correlated. Specifically, this model, the square exponential, defines a precise mathematical formula for defining how the correlation changes as a function of the distance. So you see that uh, uh, here on the y-axis, I have, suppose, a correlation. This number that generally is between minus 1 and 1, but here is between uh, 0 and 1, because in this model, the correlation is always positive. You never have negative. And then, this says that when delta x, the distance between the two points, is zero, then the correlation is one. And then, if you move far away one point from the other, the correlation decays. Following this specific bell-shaped curve, this is why I call the square exponential, and the rate of decay is related to what is called the correlation length of a landscape, lambda. So, specifically, uh, if you're working on a, on a region, where delta x is measured, suppose, in kilometers, then lambda, the correlation length, is also measured in kilometers and tells you how far away you have to go for the correlation to decay from 1 to for about 60%. Okay? So, for example, if you just look at this blue curve here, you see that that is the cur uh, shows how the correlation decay when lambda equals 1 kilometers, and you can check that when delta x is equal one kilometer, the correlation is 60%. So the idea, again, to recap, is that for this specific model, if the distance between two points is very short, the correlation is one. If the distance is very, very long, the correlation goes to zero. And specifically, the correlation length lambda tells you how fast it decays, how far away you have to go for the correlation to decay of a certain rate, up to 60%. So, given that, you can define essentially, uh, for if, if you define many points in a region, suppose, or uh, many points along one line, you can define what is the correlation among all these points. So the idea is that if you select a lambda that, uh, that are very short, like lambda equal one kilometers, essentially points that are pretty close one to the other, like within one kilometer distance, are highly correlated. Points that are maybe 10 kilometers far apart essentially are independent because the correlation goes to zero. If you increase the correlation length, if you use an alternative model with a larger correlation, essentially you are assuming that there are more similarities between points that are far apart. For example, if the correlation is three kilometers, you are assuming that points that are three kilometers apart are still highly correlated, still 60% correlation. Okay, so just these you know, are samples uh, derived from this continuous process for different value of lambda. When lambda equal one, for example, one kilometer, suppose, you have a pretty smooth field in which essentially it takes, uh, you know, it takes a long distance for the field really to change. If you use a uh, short at lambda, you see you have a less and less correlation. So the field is less and less smooth. It changes more and more rapidly. I can even show you some movies that say the same thing. Lambda equal three kilometers, you have a very smooth field like this. But if you increase lambda, sorry, decrease lambda to half a kilometer, then essentially if you just move one kilometer apart, you have completely different values. Okay. So essentially, when you define lambda, you are uh, defining how fast uh, you know this field is changing from one point from the other, and that is really crucial for defining you know how the inference process is working. Because if lambda is very high, 
That's essentially what that means, but because the field is very smooth, um, you can learn a lot by measuring the value of the field in one specific location. Because in a, in a large surrounding, so a surrounding area, the field will be similar to that that you are measuring. On the other hand, if the lambda is very short, you have a very local effect of your measure. So this is shown here. You know, suppose you have a temperature field, you know, and at the beginning, you know, you have no idea is if is suppose one part of the room or the other part of the room is hotter or cooler. So you have this simple prior model, you know, where you have this uh, this Gaussian prior everywhere, and you, you you specify a specific correlation, and then. Uh, when you measure that in one specific location, uh, the temperature is, in this case, in location four, uh, four kilometers, suppose, along this line, is 75 uh, uh, Fahrenheit, that, using the formula for the inference of Gaussian process, you are able to update uh, the value of the temperature, not just in that location, but also in the surrounding area. So, for example, you know, you're, according to your updated belief, you tend to think that for, for sure the temperature, the real temperature, has to close to the measured value of 75 in this location, but not just in this location, also in the surrounding area, as you see, your uncertainty is very small, right, because of the correlation, because you think that the field has to be smooth, and consequently, you know, the temperature has to be close to 75 Celsius, also in the surrounding area. And then, you know, when you collect more and more information, you can update your, what you know about the field by accumulating this information. So by the way, here the idea that the white area, if here defined the 95% 90, uh, confidence bound. So here, for example, you know, in any point, you know what is your uncertainty, and it's very small when you have a lot of measure, is, is, is still very high when you don't have so many measures. It's kind of intuitive, and it's natural to come from this, uh, this Gaussian model. And then you can also extend this to dimension more than one pretty easily. If we are dealing with a region, instead of one line, we can do essentially the same. We can define this joint model for the region. So you know, these are examples. You, you, now you have to define two lambdas, more or less. But uh, again, the idea that if lambda is very high, you have a very smooth change of, uh, of this field in different locations. If, on the other hand, lambda is pretty short, the field is changing pretty rapidly from one point to the other. So essentially, the same thing that happened in dimension one can be extended to dimension to dimension uh, more than one. Okay? This is a value pretty short lambda. And again, these are samples taken from the field. Essentially, tells you that you, can't, you cannot learn much from one location to a location that a bit far apart, and lambda is very short. Let me now conclude showing what is the relationship between this and decision making. Okay, so the idea is now that suppose you have Carl will talk about fields for, for, for now, let's just focus on a couple of random variables. Two Gaussian random variables, and they define maybe the demand and the capacity of one specific component. Think that it is a bridge. And D define the demand of the bridge, C is the capacity of the bridge. And there are two independent normal distributions. Maybe you have mean and variance for each of that. Right. Uh, and then the idea is that easily, to, you know, by using the classical method of reliability analysis, it's pretty easy to define what is the probability of failure. Probability of failure by, is by definition the probability that the demand is above the capacity. So in this case, you know, is the probability that if you sample a value from the blue line and another sample from the red line, the value that you sample from the blue line with from the demand would be above your sample. In this case, for this specific example, this occurs with probability 0.9%, even less than 1%, because you see basically you have a high capacity and no demand, roughly. But you know, depending on, you know, this is a high value, I mean, 1% of course is a big value for a civil structure, but you know. Okay, so now let's suppose that you can measure maybe indirectly the capacity. You install the sensor, and the sensor tells you better what is the capacity of your component. Maybe it's not a perfect measure. It is, you know, a noisy measure, you know, defined by, by some Gaussian norms. Then, you know, you, this measure is related to a Gaussian likelihood. So, for example, suppose that the measured value of the capacity is about uh, 120 kN but is less than the expected capacity. 
But you also know what is the noise. The noise value is 10 in terms of standard deviation. So by using uh, Bayes' rule, you're able to combine the prior, Ga the Gaussian prior, and the Gaussian likelihood, and you get a Gaussian posterior. This is nothing else, essentially, than an application of what I showed you before. Let's say when everything is Gaussian, you know, the posterior stays Gaussian. <coughs> uh, so in this case, for example, the effect of getting this measure is that you learn that the capacity of a structure is less than expected. It's still uncertain, maybe because the sensor was uncertain, but it's less than uncertain, less than expected. In this case, the, the posterior probability of failure goes up from less than 1% to 1.5%. This is an effect of the shift to the left of the probability of the capacity. And let's see how this is related to decision making. Now, for obvious, Sebastian, I'm sure, that tells you a lot about decision making. This is you know, a very simple example in which there is just two actions that you can make, repair or do nothing, and then the loss that you're gonna pay is a function of the fact that essentially the component is gonna fail and, uh, and is a function of what you're doing. According to this matrix, if you do nothing and the structure is undamaged, it's not going to fail, you pay nothing. But if you do nothing and the structure is going to fail, you pay the high cost, $1 million, this is the cost of failure. And the alternative is repair the structure. And if you repair the structure, no matter what is the, the state, it is going to fail or not, you just pay the cost of repair, $10,000, that is, of course, much less than the cost of failure. And in this context, the question is, what shall you do? Shall you repair or not? And you can easily solve this optimization problem. You have to figure out what is the expected cost if you do nothing, what is the expected cost if you repair, and pick up the best option. Right? So it turns out that for this simple uh, the policy, the optimal policy for this simple model is very simple. That is, you find out what the probability of failure is, and you compare it with this threshold, that is the ratio between the cost of repair and cost of failure. It turns out to be 1%, okay? The ratio between 10K and 1 million dollars. 1 million euros, sorry, because we are talking in euros. So, uh, if the probability of failure is less than 1%, you do nothing, you can take the risk. But if it's above 1%, you, you do not take the risk and you repair. And so, this is, you know, you see what happened before, your prior optimal action was doing nothing, and after you learn that the structure is weaker than expected, you repair. Okay? And, yeah, this is the fact of taking the measure. And then essentially you can compute, this is just the same example, just to recap, and you can compute what is the value of getting this information. You know, you know your kind of hope that you know what the value of information is, you can uh, integrate on all the possible observations, and you have expected cost by, uh, by taking this observation. So this expected cost depends on the precision of your sensor. In this parametric analysis, I let the, the, the precision of the sensor change for, from a very precise, uh, so from a, uh, a very noisy sensor on one hand, and if the sensor is very noisy, essentially you're learning nothing, okay, because the sensor is too noisy. So uh, this is essentially no value at all. You see basically that this, this expected cost here in the end is equal to the prior cost, about 10K, okay? On the other hand, you have a perfect sensor. So here, you know, when the precision of a sensor is, kind of when, when the accuracy is infinite, you know, when the error introduced by the sensor is zero, you have a perfect measure of capacity and in this case, the expected management cost is much less. The expected cost is much less. Now, the value information is defined as the cost in any, in any point, uh, sorry, the prior cost, the 10K more or less that you see here on the right, where you have no sensor, minus the minor cost that you have when you have a specific sensor. But you see basically that the value information is pretty high when the sensor is very precise, and then it decays with the noise of the sensor. The more noise is the sensor, the less in the value of the measure. And then, you know, up to, you start from the value of perfect information about capacity, that is pretty high, about $3,000. It's pretty high, but it's not infinite. Okay, of course it's not infinite. Up to zero, when you have a, a very noise sensor, the value is zero. And then you can compare that, maybe with the cost of a sensor. In principle, you know, if you have also a model for the cost of a sensor, you can compare the value of a sensor and the cost, and only in this region 
when the, when the value is above the cost, uh, it is good to install the sensor because outside this region, the sensor is too expensive, so to speak, or too noisy, and it doesn't really make sense sorry, to, to install the sensor. And even in principle, you can figure out what is the best sensor as, as that that maximize the gain, kind of, maximize the difference between value and cost. This theoretical is the best sensor. So this analysis tells you that you should, you should install a sensor with a specific accuracy. Not too accurate, because that is too expensive, and not uh, too noisy, because there's no point in having that. And then I will just uh, you know, uh, end up showing you just, just some uh, uh, parametric analysis that shows you what happens when you change uh, you know, some specific uh, uh, input in your model. For example, what if the prior uncertainty that we had on the capacity was higher? The question is, uh, if we had a higher uncertainty in our capacity, is the value of information higher or lower? And as you see basically in this parametric analysis, that shows you that if you increase the uncertainty, okay, if you assume that you, less, you know less and less about the prior capacity, then the value of information goes up because you're learning more and more by installing the sensor. That tells you that if you, know, if you have a very a very small prior uncertainty, there's really no point in installing a sensor. But if you don't know much, then you should install the sensor. This, you know, by the way, mathematically, you, you can find out cases where this is not really correct, but also interesting. But overall, this is the trend. And then the other analysis is what happened when I, in my mind, I change uh, the expected capacity. What if I consider a structure that are stronger and stronger, suppose? Is the value information, does it go up or down? And here, kind of interesting, maybe you start with this model, you have this, this value information, then you consider uh, you know, another model according to which your prior capacity is higher, and the value information goes up. But then, if you consider structure that are in you know, a model that gives even higher expected uh, capacity, the value information goes down. That shows, essentially, that you know, when your suppose, uh, uh, when your prior belief about the capacity is that your structure is very, very, very weak, there's no really value in installing a sensor because you know that you know, you're going to have bad news and you got to repair the structure in any case. On the other extreme, if the structure is very, very strong, again, there's no point in installing the sensor because you will learn that the structure is so strong that you don't need to install any sensor. You have not to repair. In between, there is a sweet point in which essentially you don't know what to do, you know, and there is where the value information is very high. So even that, I can pass to Carl, you know, the, the mic to, to complete, you know, the, this lecture. If there's any question you can ask now, maybe at the end of the lecture, I will listen you know, also to Carl part, and then you can pose some questions also in the end. But feel free to ask me anything now. I have a question. Uh, in the, for example, slide 30, when you show the graph in the top side and the right, just an example, I, I, I don't understand very well the concept of the optimum cost. So when you say, for example, the sensor uncertainty is very low, so you have a lower optimum cost, and then if the sensor uncertainty increase, the optimum cost increase. So could you try to explain me the concept of this graph. It is like 30 to slide 30. Yes, just for example, in 30, the first graph on the right in the top. <coughs> what is the concept? Right, right. What so is the concept of perfect. optimum okay, cost? So, um, so we start with a specific value of expected capacity, uh, and that tells you that in this specific setting, for example, the prior action would be to repair. Suppose right, the prior action would be to repair. They mean that you know the probability of failure in this case is about five percent. is too high. You cannot tolerate the risk, and you repair. And you're going to pay 10k because 10k is the cost of repair. Okay. 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 Right. So if you install the sensor and the sensor is very very noisy, you learn nothing, and your expected cost will be still 10k because the sensor is too noisy to give you any really any relevant information. Right. Okay. Okay. On the other hand, if the sensor is very, very precise, uh, there is a chance that you learn that the structure is very strong, 
maybe the, the capacity of the structure is around 140 or something, and in that case, so there is a chance that you will skip the repair, and because of this, the, the optimal cost, sorry, the expected cost is going down, so this is why there is a value of information. If the sensor is very precise, it, it may influence your behavior, and there is a positive value, right? This is the starting point. Okay. Okay. Now, let us consider uh, another case in which uh, the, prior, uh, the prior capacity is stronger. As you see in the graph on the top, uh, the expected, uh, these are good, good news. So this case is always better than before. And this is reflected from the fact that the optimal cost cannot be higher. Okay? Yes. It's true that the, the prior action, the prior optimal action is still to repair because the prior probability of failure is still above 1%. So, you know, you know, if you have no information, you have to repair nonetheless, and so the, the expected cost is still at 10K. So this is why the two lines, the red one and the, the green one, in this graph on the top of the right, they end up exactly at the same value of 10. Okay, I understand. Okay. Okay. But, okay, there is a higher chance that you will discover that the structure actually does not need repair. And this is why, if you have a, a precise sensor, the optimal cost is going down. Okay? And this is why the value information is higher. Yes. Okay. When you consider still, suppose in this case, still uh, stronger structures, you see that the optimal cost is always going down. So if you, if you shift your model to, to the right, the model in terms of uh, uh, capacity to the right, if you consider a stronger, stronger structure, these are always good news. The expected cost is always going down. But this does not mean that the value information is going up. Because consider this last case, the pink case that I showed you here. Essentially, the prior action, the prior probability of failure is about 0.1%. So the prior action is do nothing. Let's do nothing. The risk is completely tolerable. And um, so this is why the prior uh, expected cost is a little bit less than 2K. This is just uh, this product of $1 million and this very small probability of failure. When you install the sensor, you can actually discover that no, the, the, the structure is weaker, maybe you need to repair, but very, this is very, very unlikely to happen. See, this curve here is very flat, means that uh, you know, it's, very, it's very unlikely that you will change your prior action and you will decide to repair. And because of this, the, the value information is very, very small. You can think of the limit case in which the structure is infinitely strong, then the optimal cost goes down to zero, but no matter what information you collect, it will stay at zero, so the value information will be zero. And this kind of intuitive idea, why the value information goes up and down. Yes, I understood. Thank you very much. Sure. I have another question. Another question, yes. Yeah, it's on slide uh, 17. Uh, you are generating uh, trajectories which are uh, respecting um, a measure of your temperature, and uh, how do you generate those trajectories? I mean, how do you impose that you are respecting this this value, or or do you uh -huh. choose no. or, do, or do you choose? Good, 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 good. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not Carl can give more details on it, but the, 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 the basic idea is pretty simple. So, uh, you know, the, the samples, the trajectories, are essentially samples from uh, a normal distribution. In dimension one, it's pretty simple to generate samples from a normal distribution, right? MATLAB, you know, you can use the run function in MATLAB. Uh, you know, so do you agree that if you have a univariate normal distribution, it's pretty simple to generate samples from that, right? Yeah. I don't know, something, right? You got a normal distribution, and you easily able to generate samples from that, right? <laughs> Now, if you have a, a multivariate normal distribution, it turns out that it's also pretty simple to generate samples. This is what, uh, what is reported in this graph on the right. Okay? The multivariate normal distribution is defined by mean vector and covariance matrix. If you have these two, you can easily generate samples from this, uh, from this uh, multivariate normal distribution. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Now, when you, uh, when you process some measure, essentially where the equations, you have 
equation that may look easier or complicated, maybe the first time that you see it pretty complicated, but after some thinking are not too much, are just an uh, equation of linear algebra. Mm -hmm. And what this equation, what we do, is changing, suppose, the mean vector and the covariance matrix from the prior value to the posterior value. The prior value is essentially what you have before the nature. The posterior is what you have after the nature. So in the background, there is this updating, even by this formula. I say, okay, this was my prior model, and now this is my posterior model. The prior was normal, the posterior is normal. And now here, what I do is just uh, uh, representing uh, this, uh, this posterior model by generating samples and plotting the samples. I plot the samples, you know, uh, you know, the samples is just a vector, and I plot the samples along uh, one line showing, showing this as a function. Is it clear? Yes. Yeah, okay. can, can, I, can I maybe just add that when you do the uh, conditioning, then you include a measurement uncertainty. Uh, so I, you, you, you don't condition on a deterministic observation, right? Right, right, right. As you see, right here, you have some some residual uncertainty also in the point where you take the measure, and this is why exactly because we, we use some noise. So you see, on one hand, you have formula for perfect observation, but you can also very similar formula when you allow from some noise, you know, affecting your measure. Yeah. So but yeah, the thing in is that example I show, and also Carl probably we talk about using noise. So usually we 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 allow for some noise, Gaussian noise, affecting each of the measure. Yeah, but uh, also the thing is that the covariance function disintegrates if you input certain information, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I'm not understood that. Can you repeat, sorry? The covariance function disintegrates if you input uh, certain information. Then you have like uh, like uh, the singular points in in, uh, in in the covariance function in, in the field. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Maybe, I don't know. What if we, because I don't get the question perfectly, but what if Carl, Carl knows this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I as. I don't understand why, because I, mean, I cannot answer the question. So, but Carl's uh, so, I think as long as you're. It's conditional on the observations have to be of a specific form where they're a linear combination of the variables plus a noise which is Gaussian. So, there are certain types of information that. If you tried to incorporate it, the math wouldn't work. Like if you just know that I observe a value and it has to be greater than a certain value. That's not an observation of this form. So that couldn't be processed with this model. You have to, uh, there are ways to do it, but it's it's not just this linear algebra. You have to actually do like a Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just mentioning oh. it that if, if you don't have the noise term, yeah. then, then you have a problem. Because the covariance function, so you you have the you have the uh -huh. no variance uh, in in the point of the observation. Yeah, uh, I th I think it still uh, works out, but you just you have a zero in the it doesn't work. Okay. No, the uh, you, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, calculate the inverse of the uh, covariance matrix. Okay. If you have a measurement with exactly zero noise, yeah. uh, it introduces some, you can't invert the matrix basically to do the updating. No, right, but if you have a, ma a measure with zero noise, essentially that's, that component is not a random variable anymore, yeah. and all the rest of the field. So right, you, you, you have just to use a, a reduce uh, matrix for all the other part of the field except that that you that you measure, right? Exactly. Right. You can define a, a, a well-defined covariance matrix, covariance matrix for all the the part of the field that you have not measured, and this is what the, this formula says, right? So this uh, in this uh, formula here on the top, the size of this covariance matrix is less than the size of a joint covariance because you have observed a subset of a random variables so that you, know, you can define a field just on the remaining random variables that you have not observed exactly right. Mm 
Exactly. But I just wanted to say it because if uh, some of the students that they want to go home and try it at home, they, oh, sure. uh, they remember to include the noise term. Otherwise, you will get uh, you get a lot sure, of sure, problems. No, no, it's a really good point, right? There's some numerical issue, right? You're right. Essentially, the, the noise is zero when you try to invert. No, no, that's a really good point. That I think uh, the point is really that probably when you have a perfect measure, you can't. Exactly as you say, you cannot define um, a covariance matrix, including also the variable that you have observed. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So. Thanks for the clarification. OK, very Carl has a very long lecture to go, so maybe it's better to that he will start covering this, this last part of that, right? OK. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Introduction to sort of the Gaussian process model, which is a way of modeling random variables that uh, are distributed over space and having them uh, be related to each other. Uh, and I'm going to sort of go forward with that, uh, looking at how that <coughs> impacts value of information. So we just saw an example with uh, you know value of information for one Gaussian random variable, or actually two Gaussian random variables, but we're only measuring one of them. Uh, but now, what if we have a whole field of random variables and we're measuring multiple variables? Uh, how that affects uh, value of information? So the yeah, the idea basically is if we have a, a field which defines a set of random variables which affect our system, these random variables are correlated with each other. We can take observations either on one or of many of these random variables. Uh, these random variables are affecting the states of our system uh, through some sort of a limit state function, for example. Uh, and then, of course, we're taking actions to manage our systems, and then the combination of these states and the actions defines uh, our loss or our consequence function. And, uh, and then our total consequence for managing a whole system may be uh, a function of the consequences for managing different parts of the system or uh, more complicated uh, interaction of the states and actions we take on various parts of the system. And then we can, uh, of course, uh, the end idea is, of course, to assess what's the value of any individual measurement and then use that value to select which measurement or measurements uh, we should take of the system. Uh, so I think uh, the first thing I want to do is just briefly recap the idea of value of information and also kind of introduce the notation because it's a little <coughs> bit different from what we saw this morning. Uh, but basically we have a set of random variables f, which describe in some way the state of our system. So these could be sort of uh, strains on different parts of the system, basically just a set of, of variables. Uh, this was sort of x in the morning. Uh, we have a set of actions that we're taking to manage the system. So uh, in the early examples, you saw sort of a choice of whether or not to uh, repair a component. Uh, so that's sort of an action decision. And then together, these define uh, a loss function in the Morning, I guess we were more optimistic. We had a benefit, which we were trying to maximize. Here, I have a loss, which we're trying to minimize. But it's, it's the same idea of uh, what's the utility of this combination of states and actions. Uh, and that kind of encapsulates how much we're paying uh, to manage the system or how much benefit we're getting to manage. The benefit would just be a negative loss. Uh, and then, of course, in the, in the prior condition, what we want to do is uh, we can compute for any action we take. Uh, we take the expectation over the possible states of the system we can get, and we can compute the, the expected loss we're going to incur for any action we take. And then we want to choose the action which minimizes our expected uh, costs. So this is the sort of the prior uh, analysis that we do. So without any additional information, we just want to choose an action that uh, minimizes our expected loss or maximizes our expected benefit. 
Uh, and then now if we had access now to an observation, which is uh, related to the state of the system, before we choose our actions, uh, what we now, we are having, we're doing the expectation, but now using the posterior distribution of f conditional to our observation, uh, which in this case is y. And we want to, of course, again, choose the action which now gives us the min uh, minimal minimal expected loss or maximum expected benefit conditional to this observation. So this is the sort of the uh, conditional uh, <coughs> the conditional cost condition to this observation. And then, of course, if we want to do the expected analysis, we have to take an expectation over all possible outcomes of that observation. And that gives us our posterior uh, expected loss. And value of information is the difference of these two. So how much, how much, in an expected sense, how much less we expect to pay as a result of making better decisions based on this new information we've just gathered. Uh, and again, it has some key properties. You can uh, compare this to the cost of a measurement. So you should only uh, choose to acquire information if the value it will provide is uh, uh, greater than the cost of collecting the information. And uh, as an upper bound, you can say that the value of perfect information is sort of the maximum possible value of information, where the value of perfect information is the value of information I would have if I, complete, if I had perfect information about what the state of the system is before I choose what actions I'm going to take. Uh, so now we're going to now kind of extend to uh, a larger system. So we're going to see how the complexity of this is affected by the size of the system. We saw a bit of that in the morning with uh, the decision tree branches. And we saw that as we have more and more possible states, more and more possible actions, the number of branches can grow uh, exponentially. So that, as I said, the, the three parts of this uh, analysis, we need to take an expectation over possible states. Number of states can grow exponentially with the size of the system. We have to minimize over possible actions. Actions grow exponentially as well. And we have to take an expectation over all possible observation outcomes. And if we have many different observations we're taking on different parts of the system, exponential growth in that. So overall, uh, very exponential growth in the, the size of that decision tree. Um, so if we're going to look at sort of larger problems, we need to adopt strategies to avoid this growth. We saw some uh, strategies earlier. I want to uh, just point out. It's uh, maybe related to one of the strategies, but it's maybe a different way of looking at it. Uh, if we can express our loss function in this way, so the, the cost for managing our entire system, a function of all the variables affecting the system, and all the actions we take to manage the system, if we can express that as a sum of uh, losses, where each of these losses is a function of some subset, uh, some disjoint subset of the variables affecting the system and a subset of the actions affecting the system, uh, we get some benefit, which I'll go into. But just intuitively, this is, uh, in a lot of cases, we, we sort of take this kind of a approach. Like if we're managing maybe a, a farm of wind turbines, we can say the cost for managing the whole farm is the sum of the cost of managing each. If we have sort of the the, the cost of managing a wind turbine is a function of the state of the wind turbine and the actions we take to manage it. We're taking uh, each turbine's in a different state. We're taking different actions to manage the turbines. And we can say maybe, at least approximately, the cost for managing the whole wind farm is the sum of the cost of managing each turbine. Uh, so if we plug this into the uh, value of information expression, we can take advantage of uh, the mathematical properties, first of the expectation. So the uh, expectation of a sum is the sum of expectations. So we can move the uh, expectation through the summation there. We can also take the effect, advantages of the fact that if we're minimizing a sum and uh, each element, each sum and there is only a function of a subset of the decision variables, we can minimize the sum by minimizing each part of the sum separately. So here we're only sort of choosing from a subset of actions that minimize this term and if we do that for every term we then minimize have minimized the sum because uh, I'm assuming that None of the actions we take that affect one term are going to affect any of the other terms in the summation. And finally, we use the linearity of expectation again uh, to move that through. So uh, we can also do this, of course, if we're not conditioning on any, if we're not taking any measurements, then we're in the prior case. The measurements just drop out, but uh, the math still applies. And now the value of information can be written 
basically as a summation of local values of information. So instead of evaluating value of information using this full loss function, we evaluate uh, value of information on each part of the system using the local loss function, and then sum up to give the value of information at the whole system level. Uh, and the important thing is here, we're still taking an expectation over all the observations. Uh, the consequence of that is that uh, measurement on one part of the system, because of the, if, for example, we're using kind of a Gaussian field, as we saw with, uh, with uh, Mateo's presentation, observing one part of the field uh, updates our knowledge about the whole field, uh, not just where we're making the observation. Uh, so in this way, even though sort of the, the consequences for managing things that happen in different parts of the field uh, might be separate because of this, the information we collect can be used to update our knowledge for the whole field and compute the value of information based on uh, that. Uh, and we, we still get the benefit of, uh, ex of uh, taking information we collect at one point and using it to update our model of the whole system. Uh, and then, of course, this, because we only have to deal with a subset of variables and a subset of actions at each time, this greatly reduces the computational cost. And uh, if we further consider that in typical situations, we're not taking measurements of every possible variable in our system, we're only measuring uh, a small subset of the variables, uh, we get even further reductions in computation. Uh, so uh, another benefit uh, we can get is specifically when we're dealing with these uh, Gaussian random field models. Um, of course, one benefit, as Matteo talked about, was that you can uh, update from prior to posterior distribution just using a linear algebra equation. Uh, another benefit, which is related to that, is that it's a little bit easier to compute value of information as well. So, uh, again, if we have this Gaussian model of our system, linear observations with Gaussian noise, if we have sort of our, our state variables, which are functions of uh, like a limit state very a limit state function here, which is a linear combination of the random variables affecting the system, then our limit state variables will also be Gaussian. Uh, so, for example, in, a, in the kind of uh, example Matteo showed where you have uh, uh, two states, you know, operational or, uh, you know, capacity exceeds demand, capacity is less than demand, so it means system is operational, system is failed, two possible actions, do nothing or repair. Uh, we can sort of look at that graphically and say, okay, if I repair the system, I pay the same penalty regardless of what the failure probability is. Whereas if I do nothing, my expected cost that I'm going to pay increases because the expected cost there is product of the probability of failure and the consequence of failure. My optimal action, then of course I want to minimize this. So for any given probability of failure, I should choose the action which gives me the minimum of those two. So uh, you know, below, in this case, the, the numbers are different, so the threshold is actually uh, 0.25 here. So below that we should do nothing, above that we should repair. And in the prior case, of course, we have the, the prior probability of failure is a specific value which we compute. So the, from the reliability index, we can compute a specific probability of failure of our component. Uh, and then inputting that, we can figure out what we should do and then what the expected cost of that is. So we can uh, formulate our expected loss as a function of probability of failure. Uh, in the posterior case, what we actually have is a distribution over probabilities of failure. Uh, the reason for this is any measurement we take, we update our model and we compute a new probability of failure. If we have a distribution over possible outcomes of our measurements, we're going to end up with a distribution over uh, the probabilities of failure after the updating process. And for example, it may look something like this, where uh, for some measurements, we're going to measure the system to be safer than we thought it was, so that we have a high probability that we'll have a low probability of failure after updating. For some measurements, we, the system will be uh, less safe than we thought it was, so we'll tend to get uh, probabilities of failure that are higher. And then some measurements will be inconclusive and we'll end up with a probability of failure somewhere in the middle. Uh, the posterior expected loss, so the expected loss uh, conditional to that observation, that uh, random observation, is basically the integral of this curve weighted by this distribution. Uh, if we then realize, as we learned earlier, that the <coughs> probability of failure is related to this reliability index, uh, then in the specific case of the Gaussian system, we have uh, this very nice property that 
conditional to an observation, our reliability index is actually a Gaussian distribution because of uh, just the way that Gaussians work in this, this example. So uh, what we have is, given a specific uh, observation we might take, uh, every observation we make will update our probability of failure and therefore update our reliability index. If we have a distribution over possible observations, which is Gaussian, and uh, we do the same sort of thing, uh, we're going to have a distribution over probability of failures, and if we convert that back to a distribution over reliability indices, that just happens to also be Gaussian, so, which is a nice property. And then the sort of the practical consequence of this is here we have an expectation over observations, and we may have any number of observations. So that expect that uh, integral we're doing to compute that expectation is has to be the integral with respect to the probability distribution over uh, the joint distribution of all the observations. Uh, here, sorry, we can also compute that in the same way using this equivalence as expectation over our reliability indices and the reliability index for a component is just one number. So observations can be, you know, we can have 10 different observations, so that's a 10, 10 random variables, we have to take an expectation over 10 random variables. Reliability index for a component is just one random variable, so we're taking an expectation over only one random variable, which is easier to do. Uh, so that's very kind of brief uh, overview of how kind of the advantages of, or how to avoid some of the computational difficulties associated with scaling up to large systems, which in addition to some of the things we learned about this morning uh, can be used. So, uh, yeah, this is just uh, summarizing. If you have a Gaussian system together with sort of a, a loss function that decomposes in that way, uh, you can get some uh, good computational benefits from that. Okay, so let's uh, run through maybe an example. Um, so, uh, just as, as a simple example, let's say we have a uh, roof uh, which is uh, loaded up with a snow load. You can't actually, it's not showing up on the screen, unfortunately. So, uh, okay, here we go. So, let's say the, the profile of the loading on the roof looks something like this. Uh, the snow load on the roof looks something like this, which is given by uh, you know, a Gaussian distribution with this kind of exponential form to get sort of the smoothness. And let's now say that we can sort of measure the depths of snow at a given point to get a likelihood, update our prior to a posterior, uh, and now sort of draw samples from the posterior distribution, as you saw earlier, are now uh, conditional to that observation. And then if we, of course, make multiple measurements of the, the depth of, of the snow, we would uh, our sort of draws from the posterior would get closer and closer to the, sort of the actual profile that we're looking for. Uh, so now the question is, where do we want to make those observations? We can only make a limited number of observations. Let's say we can only make one observation. In the simplest case, where should we make that observation? And we want to answer that with a uh, value of information, of course. So uh, let's say if the loading exceeds a certain capacity threshold, we'll have a local collapse of that section of the roof. So uh, for this profile with this given capacity threshold, we have collapse in those areas which incur a certain cost for us, which is proportional to the amount of area that's collapsed. We can, of course, take an action, for example, clearing snow off different areas of the roof, which will avoid those negative consequences. We can uh, do the same sort of thing where we compute sort of uh, expected cost, so if we, if we choose to do nothing, or if we choose to do nothing, our expected cost will increase as we go from uh, one side to the other. It's not showing up here, but there's a higher probability. The, the sort of the, the average, the mean looks something like a line here, where there's a higher chance that will exceed this threshold here. Higher probability of failure, higher expected cost towards this end, whereas clearing the snow off has the same cost regardless of where we're doing it. And we want to choose the choice which minimizes our, our losses. So, we, so in, the, in the prior case, with no additional information, we would choose to remove snow from this area, but not do anything there. And of course, if we take an observation, we update our model, changes the probability of failures, changes what optimal action we should take. 
take an expectation over the possible uh, outcomes of our measurement, and we can actually compute the value of information as a function of the point where we're taking our measurement, and that looks like uh, the following. So we have the peak is here, so the best location to take our measurement would be here. Uh, that's a function of several different uh, several different properties. First off, the sort of the the average is increasing as we move from left to right, so it's a more likely failure. But at the same time, our uh, our prior optimal actions say, okay, we have a more likely failure here, so uh, we should uh, be more conservative and remove snow from this area. But then at this point, the consequences of choosing to remove snow or not are equal to each other. So this is kind of the point. You would th this is sort of the decision point. But again, the measurement is not exactly there because when we take a measurement, we learn a little bit about what's happening in the vicinity around it as well. And you can see from this, uh, maybe you, uh, you can maybe see this is sort of the confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are much narrower here, so we have uh, a, a narrower uh, or less uncertainty towards this side and towards this side. So it's a it's an interplay of all these different factors that are set, that are uh, kind of ending up with where the value of information is highest if you're making this one measurement. Uh, just inter uh, maybe an interesting thing to note: if you if you tune the consequences so that the the failure is twice as bad, uh, you know, has twice the consequences of this. Repair action, we actually get the, the thing where it's a misclassification problem, where you're trying to actually predict, am I above this line or below? Uh, typically, the consequences of failure are very different from the consequences of the consequences of sort of failing, failing to do anything and having a failure are much higher than the consequences of uh, you know taking an intervention action when you didn't actually need to. So, uh, okay, and then of course it's a function of sort of the actual uh, process uh, that we're trying to deal with. So, in this case, uh, we had to make a different decision for every point. Do we remove snow or do we not? In this case, let's say we have to make a f one decision for the entire structure. Do we remove snow everywhere or do we not remove any snow? Uh, so, this, is, this leads to sort of the value, this is a different decision-making problem. So, the value of information looks differently and the, the point of the optimal measurement is different in this case. Uh, but it's actually a more difficult problem because now uh, the loss is not the loss is not the sum of the losses at each point. We're making different decisions at each point. Now we're making the same decision across the entire structure. So we've now coupled the decision-making problem across the entire structure. So we no longer have that that uh, system where uh, we can make the assumption that the loss can be written as the sum of losses of subsets of the action. So now we have one action we need to take, so that's losses uh, coupled across the whole system. Uh, similarly, if we have we thought uh, collapse in one place on the roof will be will become a progressive collapse and lead to the collapse of the entire roof. Now the states are coupled, so the, the state of this part of the roof is now going to depend on what the loading is on this part of the roof. So again, we have this coupling across the entire system. So it's a it's a more difficult problem. We can't do that simplification that I showed earlier with decomposing the value information function. But uh, with a little bit more computational effort, we can still evaluate it and say, okay, now in this case, the value of information is highest for a measurement at this point. So we should measure uh, on this side. And that's basically a result of the fact that we want to be now very conservative and remove snow from most of the, most of the area. But if we happen to observe uh, a low loading value here, where the, the average is much lower, uh, we might be able to avoid, you know, get away with avoiding removing snow in that area, save a little bit of cost. Uh, but still uh, avoid failure. Okay, so just uh, to recap that section, uh, value information is kind of dependent on many factors, the accuracy of the measurements, uh, <coughs> the coupling, so the degree of correlation between different parts of the field that we're measuring, uh, and of course the, the actions we take, uh, the decisions we can make, and their consequences. Um, I'm going to go probably very briefly into what happens when we go uh, uh, to a temporal system. So a system where there's a random field affecting the system, but that random field is changing over time. So in the previous example, we had the snow had one shape, so it was one snowfall. But what if the snow is melting 
more snow is falling, then the, the profile of the loading is going to change over time. We have this temporally evolving system. Can, can, uh, can yes? I, just for clarification, for yes. the first case, uh, before you go into the yes. general case, um, I have a feeling that you had some sort of assumption on the uh, temporal uh, dimension. Yes. Anyway, yes. Uh, even though you don't mention it, because yes. if, 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 if you have like a realization exceeding the threshold and the root is still standing, yeah. then you will be your figure zero. Yes. Point, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. So, it, so it you, you must have some, some sort of uh, idea, so implicit idea on what is going to happen. Yes. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, in that case, it's, it's, again, it was a little bit of a simple example. Um, so we can, we can very easily see whether the roof has failed or not. So taking a measurement of the depth of the snow where the roof has already collapsed doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, kind of maybe extrapolating that to a system where it's, it's not always so obvious. Uh, I guess the, imp the important thing to say is that, um, you know, the actions we take have to be able to, we have to be able to actually have an effect on the system. So but when we, so, uh, yeah. What you might have in mind is, uh, is something like that the condition of feature failure is then too high or something. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, or, or, or where, where the conditional probability of failure would then somehow incorporate uh, time variant effects like uh, wind effects or let's say uh, uh, what's it called uh, uh, effects uh, which, which has to do with the uh, temporal uh, duration of uh, heavy loading on, uh, for instance timber structures yeah, yeah. We so, just have to add that in this constructed case, right? Because otherwise we would just observe that the structure survives. Yeah. It means that there's no probability of failure. Yeah. So we, we have to assume in this case, which is very deductive, of course, but we have to mention that there are some time variant effects we don't have control over. Yeah, so, yeah. And then we can talk about the failure problem. Yeah. I would say that, like, uh, for some reason, there's some time between when we make the observation and the actual collapse. So, yeah. if we observe this, you know, we have 24 hours before the actual collapse occurs. Yeah, but you have to, uh, you have to have a system change since then. Yeah. Right. That's the, uh, that's yeah. The there's there's something happening that's not immediately observable, but through a measurement we can deduce yeah. that that this and is not and not included in the model. And not and, and, and another one. It's uh, it's actually very interesting. So and it was also a super presentation so far. But I just wonder uh, from uh, Practical point of view again. So you you assume this spatial correlation structure with this uh, squared exponential, right? Yeah. And, and this is somehow fixed, isn't it? Yes. So what happens if you have many many observations? Uh, because because yeah. in a Bayesian context you would always update uh, yes. not only the mean but also the covariance, right? But yes. you keep this covariance fixed. So in a practical context, when you have many many observations, unfortunately this is. Uh, not very often the case, but then you you would have your spatial correlation that is maybe uh, totally inconsistent with what you have observed. You know what I mean? Uh, I would say. I think what you yes. uh, proposing is that the correlation length assumption uh, might also be. Uh, <laughs> yes. So yeah, something I I haven't discussed is yeah there can be uncertainty in that in of course the parameters affecting the model which is a you know a whole higher level of uh, decision if you have so if you have if that was the actual true correlation length yeah. and your model was absolutely correct you wouldn't have that problem yeah. but, you know, but, practically, but, but it's very obvious in this very nice practical example the yes. assumption on the spatial correlation of the snow depths. That's a tough one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you fix that somehow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would. You need uh, the sort of the drawback here is you need the model of the world. Uh, you can of course do what we saw in the morning. We have sort of the this is kind of the small world where we, we know that we know the model, 
but in the sort of bigger world example, we don't know the model exactly, and that, that adds sort of another a whole other like in the what I showed before. There's a there's there's three layers of complexity with the states, the actions, and the observations. There's a whole other maybe layer beyond that, or several layers beyond that, where we don't know the model, we don't know the parameters of the model, we don't know whether the model itself is correct, and so on and so forth. Uh, I guess I don't know if we want to. We want to take a break, and uh, or I can very quickly skip. I have a few more things which are maybe less less important than uh, going through an exam examples in the afternoon. But okay. Thank uh, you. So uh, the first thing I briefly want to uh, touch on is uh, the, the time variant problem. So if we have a system where uh, the random variables affecting our system are evolving in time. Uh, in principle, we can also kind of uh, model this with a Gaussian uh, process kind of framework if we wanted to, uh, just by extending to another dimension. So we had, uh, maybe before we had sort of one dimension of space, Mateo showed examples with two dimensions of space, but maybe we need uh, two dimensions of space and one dimension of time, for example, to describe it. Uh, we can also use kind of a correlation structure where the correlation length is now a correlation time. So over a certain number of hours, uh, variables are more or less similar to each other. Uh, so, again, in the, in the same kind of way, we can build a model where we have, at each time step, certain variables affecting the system. Uh, that affects the state of the system at that time. We can also take observations. We also take, take actions at different times. And we have uh, consequences we suffer. And uh, uh, maybe one assumption we might make is that the, the consequences we suffer from, we, from managing the system over time can be written as maybe a discounted sum of the consequences we incur at each uh, discrete uh, step in time, at each, at each year, for example. This is uh, one model we might use. Uh, I won't uh, go into details here, but just to, to briefly say, uh, the one important thing to keep in mind here is that while in the spatial case, we could take observations anywhere we wanted and use those observations to update our model of the whole system, uh, now we have to be very careful because we can only make decisions based on information we've collected in the past. We can't use decisions, uh, the outcomes of observations we're going to take in the future to guide our decisions now. So uh, our, our actions are taken in a, in a very important uh, sequential way where each, the set of actions we take at a certain time are uh, based only on the information we have up to that time. Uh, and so we have to be very uh, careful in computing that, and that's, that's also a, a big major source of computational complexities because uh, now we don't just optimize uh, what are we going to do now, we have to consider, oh, in the future we're going to gather uh, more information and we're going to change our decisions in the future uh, as well. So that's a, an additional layer of complexity which uh, I won't, I won't uh, go into details about, but just, just to be aware of that. Uh, and uh, also briefly just if we make this this kind of assumption, which is similar to the assumption I made in space, uh, we can do that and get sort of a similar similar computational savings where we can compute sort of the value information uh, as the sum of these terms. But the very important thing to keep in mind here, which is uh, which is a very important uh, restriction on this assumption, is now the actions I take at a certain time can only affect the losses at that time. So the actions I take now are not going to affect my losses in the future. And that's, uh, in, in, in many applications, that may be a very poor assumption to make because the actions <coughs> I take now are going to affect the way my system behaves in the future. Uh, so that's, in this case, in the temporal case, that could be a very restrictive uh, assumption to make to get this kind of computational savings. And you have to go through the full analysis, uh, considering sort of the, the full history of what you've done in the past uh, as well as what you're doing now to affect, is going to affect how the system evolves in the future. But, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not quite sure I, I get it. So what you're saying that the actions you take now can only affect uh, like your benefit losses right now? Uh, uh, under this assumption, yes. Uh, Which is, you know, maybe a... Uh, I mean, you can do something now, but like, um, if everything is okay, yeah. If your system is still up and has not failed, why would you do anything? Yeah, so this is uh, one, one application area for this type of thing is maybe uh, a very sort of simple model of response to an extreme event. 
So if uh, if I'm managing a system for uh, a coastal system for many years, and there are uh, there are hurricanes happening, so in the, and maybe in this year I say I'm gonna I'm gonna predict that there's gonna be a hurricane. I need to build a, a sandbags to protect my my coastal system, and then at the end of this hurricane season I take it down, and then depending on whether I built the system and whether or not a hurricane comes in that year I suffer a certain loss, and then the next year I make a new decision again. Maybe the the probability of a hurricane coming this year is related to the probability that a hurricane came the year before, but uh, okay, because so of the climate do, system. You do actually look ahead one year. Right? Yeah, you you look at you look ahead. Well, you look ahead in terms of uh, the the system is the system is evolving uh, in time. So there is benefit to taking a measurement now. If I take certain measurements, I know how the system is evolving. Maybe I know the trend. So I can make better decisions in the future, but this assumption just says that the the consequence I suffer is only the consequence of what happens in this year and what I do about it in this year, in and then the year. next year. Okay. So you have to take your uh, aspect for the next year. Yeah. So this is, I mean, again, this is a bit restrict. You this only applies when that assumption is in is in place, and in in many applications you you have to explicitly model, if I take an action now, it's going to affect how the system behaves in the future. Uh, so then that's just very briefly. Uh, a second uh, brief mention is sort of sensor placement and scheduling, uh, basically what this means. So if I, I say uh, sensor placement, what I mean is I'm, uh, I'm selecting certain places in space and I'm going to collect information either continuously or intermittently with a certain schedule uh, in time at those locations. So this is kind of a, in a structural health monitoring context, this is I'm choosing where I'm going to place my uh, strain gauges. And then, uh, you know, as the system changes, I'm always going to get measurements from those same locations from those strain gauges. Uh, a related problem is kind of a scheduling problem. I have uh, sensors in a few places, but I have to choose when I want to observe from those sensors. So uh, in some cases we have uh, power constraints. If our, if our sensors are deployed remotely and they're operating from a battery, uh, we, don't, we can't collect and transmit information all the time. We have to uh, be very uh, careful with using our battery resources. So we can't collect uh, information everywhere all the time, but uh, if we schedule appropriately, we can, we can make those decisions. And then finally, there's sort of a, an unconstrained problem where you can collect information at any point in space and at any uh, point in time. And that might be uh, if you have sort of um, many inspectors, you can maybe on some days send them out to inspect many components, and on other days you only send them out to a few locations. But it's sort of a mobile inspectors, and you can send out however many you want. Uh, and then all these cases can sort of be handled uh, with different sort of uh, cost functions or constraints in your optimization state. <coughs> the objective here is to choose the set of measurements which maximizes the value of information of those measurements minus the cost of collecting those measurements. And for example, in the, in the placement problem, it may be sort of a very small cost to collect uh, more information in a place where you already have a sensor, or it may be a negligible cost. But if you want to collect information in a new place where you don't have a sensor, uh, there may be a you know a very high cost uh, associated with installing that new sensor, so we have to trade those off as well. Uh, another distinction, just to mention, uh, the difference between online and offline in a, in a sequential problem. Uh, offline means sort of you you make a plan of what information you're going to collect, where and when you're going to take these measurements, and you follow through on that plan. Uh, this contrasts to an online case where the information you gather is then used to reevaluate and re-optimize your plan for collecting information. Uh, and of course, whenever possible, you, you want to do this because uh, obviously when you reevaluate, you're going to base that on the latest available information and you're going to, at least in an expected sense, get a better plan out of that. So basically the, the, the idea is you uh, make this plan, then you collect information at the first time step Use that information to update your, your predictions and your models. You then reevaluate your plan for the future, and then continue forward uh, in an iterative manner. And obviously, you can only do this when sort of uh, the time between these uh, sequential steps in your plan is greater than the time it takes to reoptimize your plan. So, 
if you're doing on the order of uh, you know milliseconds or seconds, it may not be practical to do an online sensing. But typically, in civil engineering, we're making decisions with sort of months or year time scale, and, and it's uh, very often going to be possible to do this online updating. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, the issue of sort of combinatorial optimization. So uh, when I select when I'm selecting measurements, what often what I'm doing is a combinatorial optimization problem. I have uh, a large set of candidates for where I can place the sensor, and from those candidates, I want to select a certain number of uh, places that I'll actually make those measurements. And so the, the, the only guaranteed way to find an optimal solution to this problem is to look at every possible combination because uh, the, the properties of the value of information are such that, uh, I'll get into that maybe a little bit more later, but um, uh, so basically the only guaranteed way to optimally solve the problem is to look at every possible uh, combination I could make, and of course the number of those combinations grows uh, very, very, very quickly with the uh, number of candidates I'm considering and the number of uh, sensors I want to place. Uh, one way possibly to avoid this, which is a way that I've uh, often made use of in, in my work, is a greedy optimization algorithm. Uh, basically what this does is instead of choosing where to put all the sensors, uh, you choose where to put the first sensor, as I showed in sort of the example with the roof, and then based on the fact that you're going to have a measurement at that location, you now choose where am I now going to place the second sensor, where am I going to place the third, third sensor, and so forth. So instead of looking at every possible combination, you uh, restrict your search by fixing sort of one, one place and then looking at all the remaining places and then fixing a second place, looking at all the remaining places and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is much more efficient but uh, we do have to be careful because there's no guarantee that this will get us to an optimal uh, solution. Uh, the reason for that is that the value of information lacks a property called uh, submodularity and uh, simply put this is kind of a diminishing returns policy where the the value you get you get from two measurements uh, if, if it did have this property the value you get from two measurements is always going to be sort of uh, uh, less than the marginal value or sorry the value you get for the two measurements is has to be less than the sum of the values you would get from each measurement individually so the basically the the more measurements you have the less uh, value each, the less marginal value each new measurement is going to provide. Uh, that is not the case for value information, and I'm going to kind of try to illustrate this with a, an example. Let's say we have a system, two components. Uh, the states are described by random variables that evolve in time. So uh, over time, the, sort of the state kind of oscillates like that. If it exceeds a certain threshold, we have a failure and a consequence associated with that. We can take actions, uh, as in the previous example, sort of a binary action which avoids that failure. Uh, and we can also take measurements of these uh, blue line at each point in time, but our measurements are going to be highly biased. So they're going to look like these orange. So this orange is a measurement of this blue, and this orange is a measurement of this blue. And there's a very high uh, offset between them, which we don't know what that offset is beforehand. Um, so the way we would attack this with the 3D optimization is as follows. We look through and we, we try to find the one measurement that gives us the highest value. Uh, in this case, we pick a measurement there, but the measurement gives us almost no value because that high bias uh, means that the, sort of the uh, uncertainty after that observation is still very high. But with a second measurement, we can now look at the two measurements, and from those two measurements, we can get an idea of what the uh, systematic bias in those measurements are, because the measurements will have a certain relationship to each other, uh, and we know from the prior model that the, the variable has a certain uh, behavior. So based on the difference between what we're predicting the variable to behave and, and where those measurements are, we can kind of get an idea of what that bias is. And that idea of what the bias is gets better the more measurements we take. And uh, it actually ends up provide multiple measurements now provide a very high value of information. So as I said uh, a little bit earlier, um, the sub in because we lack submodularity means that this one measurement by itself, sorry, provided a, a very small value, but this measurement combined with this measurement provide a very high value. So there's 
there's not a diminishing returns. If there was diminishing returns, that first measurement would provide would have provided the most value. The second measurement would have provided less value. But that combination of two provides more value than any than either of the individual measurements uh, together, and that's kind of a lack of submodularity property. Now, if we keep going forward, uh, what we eventually see is that because of this, the greedy algorithm has gotten stuck. It's only measuring here because it only had it only has measurements here. So it can only figure out what the bias is for measurements on this component. It still doesn't know what the bias is for any measurement on this, and therefore those measurements have low value and are not selected. It'll only select a measurement once it's exhausted all the measurements we're considering on this component, which in this case is 10. But once it has that first measurement, now it can go back and say, okay, now I can correct for the bias of, another measure, of other measurements with that measurement I already have. And then it goes forward and picks up a high value of information related to the management of this component. Uh, and we can see this is sort of the, the value of complete or perfect information in this problem. We've now measured everything we can, and that's sort of the max value of information. If I were to subtract uh, sort of a linear cost, uh, so cost increases linearly with the number of observations we take, this is sort of the net value of information, and then based on the net value of information, this is the optimal set of measurements we should use. So only these four measurements on this component. Uh, and intuitively, you can pretty easily say that that's that's not correct, what about managing this component? Uh, there are ways to avoid this. One way is uh, a reverse optimization, and basically this starts with the full set of all measurements and then iteratively removes measurements from the set while keeping the value of information high. Uh, you can see that that keeps measurements on both components uh, basically up until near the end where it has to abandon one of the components. And then subtracting the cost, that gives us our maximum net value of information is now much higher and it, it consists of measurements on both of these components. Uh, the main drawback of this is we had to work backwards from the set of all possible measurements. As I measured, uh, mentioned earlier, typically the set of all possible measurements is much, much, much larger than the set of measurements we actually want to use. We, we, we consider many possible options and then only choose a, a very small subset of that. So working backwards would take much, much longer to get to the best solution than working forwards. Uh, if we do want to work forward, we can use a heuristic approach by kind of switching to uh, a, different, uh, a different optimization objective, which is not the value of information, so it's not our sort of ideal objective, but it does have this submodular property. Uh, and with like a little bit of a heuristic, we can say that we, we optimize based on value of information, but when the, the sort of the rate, the growth rate of that value of information as we add more measurements drops below a certain threshold, maybe we switch to another heuristic to pick our next measurement, then switch back to value of information, and now we can kind of uh, climb up uh, back up to where we were before. So this, this is kind of one option uh, that you might use to kind of avoid these traps where uh, this greedy algorithm, although it's very efficient, falls into this uh, suboptimal solution. Uh, so that's just something to be, to be aware of uh, that even though this algorithm is efficient, uh, it, it can run into problems uh, in some cases. Uh, so with that, um, just to try to briefly summarize, uh, value of information, of course, as we're learning in the course, is very critical for supporting uh, decisions about where to collect information because it directly assesses what the benefit of that information is going to be to reduce our, to, to make better decisions and to reduce our management cost. Uh, unfortunately, the complexity grows very quickly in large systems, so uh, just sort of blindly applying the decision tree approach uh, will lead to sort of a very large decision tree uh, in a large system. So we need to take, uh, we need to take uh, basically whatever advantages we can to try to prune those, uh, prune those branches on the decision tree down to something that's more manageable. Um, the sort of assumptions we make about how the system behaves and uh, what actions we can take uh, to manage it uh, is basically what allows us to do that pruning in a good way. Uh, we saw earlier um, uh, kind of uh, splitting the decision tree based on the actions and based on the states is one way to sort of avoid that complexity. And that's a function of how the system functions and how, it, how, it, uh, how we're going to manage it. Uh, so, and then in this lecture, we, uh, Matteo talked about Gaussian random fields and how they can be used uh, as a special class of model which allows for very efficient uh, updating and also allow us to 
in a, in a principled way, describe the correlations between random variables in different locations to get kind of a smooth uh, shapes that uh, often is kind of what we want to, to describe a spatially varying phenomenon. Um, I should also mention at this point, so we can, it doesn't always have to be uh, normally distributed random variables. We can do things like uh, apply an exponential transformation. So if we have a start with a Gaussian random field, apply a exponential transformation, what we end up is a set of log normal <coughs> random variables instead of normal random variables. So we can work in, in kind of the log space and uh, work with uh, variables that are have a different uh, distribution than just a Gaussian. Uh, for other kinds of models, we may need to adopt uh, more uh, the sort of the the way to do Bayesian inference is not not so simple, and we may need to do uh, more more complicated ways to do that Bayesian inference and updating, uh, especially if we have sort of a non-parametric models. Especially, uh, I won't go into that, but just to, to be aware of this Markov chain Monte Carlo class of uh, algorithms for addressing that Bayesian updating uh, in general. Uh, and of course, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in response to uh, the question, um, something I've, I've kind of, one of the things I've glossed over here is uh, uncertainty in the model. And then in this case, it would be, uh, okay, we have a correlation length, but do we really know what that correlation length is, or is it itself a random variable? So that's uh, an idea that we don't, we don't necessarily know exactly what the correlation length is, but it, it may actually uh, be an uncertain variable, and we may need to, in addition to updating our uh, model based on or our model with a certain correlation length, we may need to also go back and, using our data, update our model, uh, update our prediction of what that correlation length actually is. Uh, and that adds sort of another level of complexity to the task. So, uh, with that, I think I'll conclude. And uh, uh, as I said, so uh, Sebastian sent out. Um, uh, an example problem that you can work on and I'd be happy to answer questions about that.